Well, good morning, everyone, and I want to welcome you to Hardy Memorial United Methodist Church and want to welcome those who are worshiping with us online this morning as well. Well, for our announcements, we have a United Methodist Women's Meeting today at 3 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall, and <clears throat> Wednesday night Bible studies um, will begin again on February 3rd. There's a few new studies. One is Joy Stealers, Overcoming the Obstacles to the Things that Bring You uh, Joy in Life. Um, <clears throat> the Jesus class that's being led by Mark and Heaven by David DeLotter. And the Heaven class is continuing right now, so if you want to come on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock, they'll be continuing that? We're going to wait and start in February. Okay, so all good. So that's not too far out. Go ahead and make your plans. And so those are our announcements this morning. We are ready for the light of Christ. Would you stand with me this morning for our call to worship? Oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. Even before a word is on my tongue, oh Lord, you know it completely. You give me in for I am full and lay your hands upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. How waiting to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. As we continue our worship this morning, would you join me in singing page 400, Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing. be seated. It's time for Mrs. Bonnie's story time.
Y'all look awesome this morning. I'm going to count to three, and we're going to say good morning super loud and super happy. One, two, three. Good morning. Pretty good. You look good, and you sound good, and I'm glad to see you guys this morning. I'm glad we're here, and I'm glad that some are listening from home. Now, a lot of you know that I have a little grandson named August, and I spend a lot of time with him. Sometimes he's at our house. Sometimes I go to see him at his house. And he, he's, he's going to be three years old this week. So you guys know that when you're that age, the kind of stuff you do. Because some of you aren't quite that age, and some of you, it was a long time ago since you were that age. But I remember a lot of you when you were that age. The, well, this is one of the things he does. He collects stuff. He collects rocks and sticks and feathers, stuff that wouldn't seem like they'd matter very much, but they matter a lot to him. And when he finds something new, he's so excited. And he always says, come and see what I have found. And, and, and if we don't come and see, guess what? He keeps going, come on, come on, come on. And eventually we go see. These, these are just a few things that he has. He's got a whole bunch of stuff at our house that he's collected. And he's also at the age that some of you guys are where he likes to do blocks. And he likes to do puzzles. And as soon as, or artwork or something like that. And as soon as he's finished with it, he says, come and see what I've done. Because he wants to, hey, but you tell me, why does he say come and see? Why does anybody say come and see when they're really excited? Tell me. Why do you go and like get your mom and dad or your grandparents and say, come and see? Why? Are you proud of it? Yeah. You want to share it? Yeah. You want somebody to say, good job. We love that. We love that when people come and see what we have done. And that reminds me of the Bible story today. The last few weeks we've been talking about since Christmas, Jesus was born as a little bitty baby. He grew into a toddler, grew into a little boy, and then he becomes a man. So those first few weeks we're talking about Jesus as a human being, born as a baby, a real human being that you could touch and hug and feelings, 100% a person, a human being. But also Jesus is 100% like we've talked about God. He's all of God, the superpowers of God, totally God. So 100% human being and 100% God. And last week we talked about him being baptized because he's beginning his ministry. This week we're talking about him picking his disciples. He's already picked a few. In today's uh, Bible lesson, he's picking a, a boy, a man named Philip. Now, I love that the Bible says that Jesus found Philip. And when he found Philip, he said, come follow me. That's what he says to his disciples, isn't it? But I love that the, in the Bible it said, in the Gospel of John, said he found Philip. And, and when he said, Philip, follow me, Philip did. Philip got up and followed Jesus. But listen to the first thing he did, and I'd never even thought about this before. Before he did any of the traveling around or, or any of the other stuff he would do, the first thing he did was go find his best friend, Nathaniel, the person that was the closest to him, because he wanted to tell Nathaniel who he had found. He had found Jesus. He had found the Lord God in a human being, and he wanted to tell him. So he goes and tells Nathaniel, and Nathaniel's like, oh, no, I don't know. And the Bible doesn't say he doesn't say, I don't know. But he does say, Jesus? You mean that guy from Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Oh, so Nathaniel, Nathaniel's not like just going, woohoo. But I like what Philip says. Philip says, well, just come and see. Just come and see him. And Nathaniel <laughs> trusted Philip enough that Nathaniel got up to go see Jesus. And of course, as soon as Jesus saw Nathaniel coming, Jesus looked at Nathaniel and said, hey, I know you. You're good and honest and kind. I've seen you sitting under a fig tree. I know you. And Nathaniel was like, woo, how do you even know me? And that was part of Nathaniel. When Nathaniel knew that, that Jesus knew him before, Nathaniel knew, surely this is the Son of God. And then Jesus says, well, you believe in me because you know that I've seen you before and I know you. But you're about to see a whole bunch of other big miracles and awesome stuff if you follow me. And, of course, Nathaniel does. He becomes one of the disciples too. So I love thinking about two things in this story. The first thing I love thinking about is that Jesus went to Philip. He found Philip and said, follow me. Does Jesus find us? Does he know where you are? Does he know where you live? Does he know everything about you? Does Jesus know everything about you? Yes. He finds us because he loves us. 
He doesn't give up on us. He knows everything. About, he knows how many hairs are on top of your head. He knows you really well. He made you. He created you. And he knows you right now. And he loves you. And he wants you to follow him. And once you decide to follow him, then something awesome happens. Once you say, Jesus, I love you, come into my heart, then, like Philip did, you want to share Jesus with other people. You want to go tell somebody else. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. Miss Beth taught that lesson about how we need to go find other people and tell them about Jesus. Well, we say, well, all this COVID stuff, I can't tell anybody anything. But guess what? We can. We can. We can do things and help other people. And even if all we do is just see somebody on a Zoom picture face, we can say, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Because that's what people need to hear. That's all we've got. That's the hope in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He loves us. He found us. He wants us. And when we say we love him back, he gives us that job to go to somebody else and say, here's Jesus. Here's my Jesus. He loves you. And we can do that. We can do that even during these times. It's our best job. So think about how you can do that with somebody you know. Show Jesus to somebody else. Say, come and see. Come and see my Jesus. He loves me and I love him. And I hope you do too. Let's say a prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for these precious children that you love so much. And I thank you, God, that they're so pure and innocent and they love you too with their whole heart. May we, at whatever age we are today, God, follow the way Philip became a disciple. He followed you, Jesus. And then he went to find other people that would come and love you too. Let us be people that say, come and see my Jesus. At whatever age we are, at whatever time it is, that's our best job. And in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Yay! As we continue in this time of prayer, we'll have a time of silent prayer together and then corporate prayer. Uh, you can put prayer requests online. You can email those in. You can text them, call the church office. Uh, but we do pray over those uh, every Sunday uh, as a group. We have a prayer group. Um, well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious heavenly God, we come this day in praise and worship of you, for you are worthy. And as we come today, dear Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit be here guiding and teaching us, leading us into the fullness of your kingdom, that your call be on each of our lives, bringing about your holiness in this world. And dear Lord, may your Holy Spirit be with me as I bring your message this day. Dear Lord, as we come today, we have prayer concerns for health and healing of friends and family, of loved ones, of church members, of people upon our hearts and minds who are suffering with the brokenness of their bodies, of their hearts, of their souls. And dear Lord, we boldly ask for healing, for recovery, for being made whole in body, soul, and mind. Dear Lord, we lift up at this time the pandemic and we boldly ask for healing. Dear Lord, we ask that this be moderated and that people, if they get sick, that they not be very sick. Dear Lord, we come as well with issues in our world, with brokenness, with drug addiction, with pain, with hurts, with brokenness. And dear Lord, we look for your healing we come as well with persons who are in need of jobs, of income, of friends and of family. And dear Lord, we ask that your kingdom be made evident. 
so that people may find security. And you made us for work and for that work to be good. Dear Lord, we come as well, lifting up our nation, that during a time of transition that your hand be upon each of us, guiding and teaching us. And dear Lord, we look for your kingdom. And we remember the world, for you loved it so much that you came and lived among us and died for our sake. And now we pray in the way that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand with me as you're able for the prayer of illumination? Remain standing for the scripture and the Apostles' Creed afterward. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Scriptures today are from 1 Samuel, verse 3 through 10, and John, verse 43 through 49. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying, lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not gone out, and Samuel was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lie down. And the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lie down in his place. The Lord came and stood there. And at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for the, your servant is listening. And from John, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good from there? Nathanael asked, come and, come and see, said Philip. When Jesus said Nathanael approaching, when he saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on you, on the Son of Man. These are the words of our Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Amen. We'll continue with the Apostles' Creed. Church, I ask you, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. The, the story of the calling of Nathaniel it seems a little strange to me. I don't know if it seems a little strange to you, but here he is. Uh, he is completely doubting that anything good could come from Nazareth. And then he hears a detail about a fig tree, and his mind is completely changed. Now, maybe that's just me. I'm like, that was it? That's all the details you needed? I'm a little bit more skeptical. Maybe it was the 20 years in banking. <laughs> it left me with issues of trust. But here he is, and all of a sudden... So, you know, this is out of the book of, um, of John. And anytime you read something out of the book of John, I'll tell you, you need to dig around in there because there, if there's details, they're there for a reason. And the details that are there uncover things that are quite significant if you'll just put the time in to dig for them. Now, the good news is this morning, I already did the digging for you. So you can just relax and you can kind of hear what I, I came up with, um, which is kind of very interesting. Very interesting. Jesus sees him coming and he said, and here is an Israelite, here is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. There's also the word guile is used. There's several others. The translations are all over the place. And, and for some reason, this rings with Nathaniel. It rings with Nathaniel. Now, the word there is a really particular word, and it almost translates to this, in whom there is no Jacob. In whom there is no Jacob. Now, if you know your Old Testament pretty well, you know this guy named Jacob. And what was Jacob known for doing? He was a little bit of a trickster. He was deceitful. He was a little slick. Maybe he was a lot slick. Uh, you, know, you guys remember the story of Jacob? You guys are really quiet. I'm like, do you remember what this guy did? He was hanging on to his brother's heel on the way out of the womb. I mean, this guy was grasping for something all the time. And so Jesus looks at him and says, in, in, in you, I see no deceit. I see no trickery. I see plain, you know, just what you see is what you get. Now, of course, you get that because he doesn't hold back when he says, is anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, he's pretty honest right there. Have you ever said something and then it is in front of somebody and you find out that's probably not the person you should have said it in front of? <laughs> I have been kicked more times by my wife. Honey, like if there were a thousand people here, that was the wrong person to say it in front of. Does anybody else live this life? <laughs> I would like to be slick. The problem is I don't have the gift Jacob had the gift. So, so, you know, why, do we, why would we be slick? Why would we do that? I think there's an underlying desire to control our own future, to control what's going on, to make things happen. We don't have a lot of trust in what might just happen out of honesty. And so there's always kind of a, maybe if I could manipulate this, I could get somewhere. Nathaniel doesn't have any of that genetic problem of wanting to manipulate things He's ready to just move into it. And so Jesus sees that in him. And, and, and you know, the, the other reason I think this has to do with Jacob is because there's a line that he says, like, if this is all it takes for you to have faith, then you'll see things, even angels ascending and descending on a ladder. What's he talking about? Jacob's ladder. So here he is. He's, he's tying it back to you're going to see Jacob's ladder. And Jacob calls that place Bethel, Beth House El God, the house of God. God is living among us. So if you see this in Jesus, in Jesus, you see God living among us. This is God's house right in the middle of us. John just explodes. I mean, you, if you go through John fast, you're just going to miss this stuff. And so 
Here is, he's saying, if this is the faith you have, the faith that you have, you'll see God in the middle of me right now. But, but <clears throat> I digress. A little bit off subject, but that's why I think Jacob's in there. And then we, we trip across this whole detail of, and I saw you under a fig tree. Okay, I saw you under a fig tree. What? Now, when, when, when Jesus saw him under a fig tree, he may have seen him from a great distance, but it says that it was his friend Philip. He said, when, when you were called by Philip, you were under a fig tree. Now, what is an Israelite doing under a fig tree? Uh, and I think that's a, I'm glad you asked that question because there is something here, right? Work with me. There, there's something here. So I began to, to look up. You, you know, in, in the back of your Bible, you can look words up and it'll tell you where they are throughout scripture. Or you can cheat and Google it. Uh, there's also biblical cross-references. So if you just cross-reference this stuff, all of a sudden, out of the Old Testament will come at least three references to an Israelite sitting under a fig tree. How about that? Not only does it say that, it says that in Micah, in the fourth chapter, it said, and every Israelite sitting under his vine and under his fig tree will be living without fear. It goes on to say it in 1 Kings and in Zechariah. This idea that you have of everybody having a vine and a fig tree in which they are seated under. And so I thought, what could that mean? And, and it came to me that the idea is, it is the idea of the kingdom of God here on earth that we have moved into a place where we have security and we have faith and we are living in the kingdom of God. So I'm like, it's a good possibility. So I decided it's good to have friends who are biblical scholars. I shot off a text to a biblical scholar, Old Testament scholar, Sandra Richter. Uh, you can look up her expertise on the Old Testament. Um, and said, does this phrase talk about the kingdom of God? And she wrote back, exactly. You are completely correct. And in fact, in both the Old and, uh, not just the Old and New Testament, but in the Old Era and the New Era of the Old Testament, it is consistent, this is referring to the kingdom of God being present in the world, that we are able to relax under a vine and a fig tree. Now, so I think about Nathaniel. Nathaniel and his friends are all waiting on Jesus. They're all waiting on the new king to come. And so in this waiting on the kingdom to come, I think is, G is Nathaniel in prayer under a fig tree? And does this all connect in Nathaniel's mind? I think in Nathaniel's mind, the meaning explodes. It explodes out this idea that I am waiting on the kingdom of God. And here it is, the one who is to be sees me waiting on the kingdom. So is he sitting under a fig tree? Yes. Is he sitting mentally under a fig tree? Yes. Is he waiting upon the kingdom of God? Yes. I think all of those things come together, and it is in that place that he hears the call of God. The kingdom of God. I want to explore a little bit more with fig trees and with vines. Um, you know, when I was a child, my neighbor, uh, Dr. Turner, who I will tell you right now, never liked a single child in our neighborhood. Did y'all ever have one of those elderly kind of curmudgeon neighbors? <laughs> I, however, as a child, did not know he didn't like children, and I went and hang out with him a lot. <laughs> Can you just picture this? <laughs> just completely clueless. I was later told by his family, they were like, well, he liked one child, and it was you. <laughs> Why not? So Dr. Turner one day decided that we needed a fig tree, and without asking us, came over into our yard, went into our backyard, dug a hole, and planted a fig tree for us without asking. 
Now, if you're in the South and somebody does this for you, you'll be talked about, but they won't talk to you about it. Does anybody else? Uh, and so here's what I learned about fig trees. We had a fig tree in our yard and growing up. And do you know how long a fig tree has to be there before you can sit under it? Have you, have you, think about this. I mean, you plant a fig tree. It's not the first year. It's not the second year. You're talking 10 years. It's five years till they produce fruit. So it takes a while for a fig tree to be in a place before it is able for us to be able to sit under it. And vineyards, how long do vineyards take? Uh, you plant vines, they take a while. For me, this speaks of if each of us has a place to sit under, it means there's been a deal of stability that's taken place for a long time. Things haven't just been fruit basket turned over and turned over and turned over. There, there has been a place where the kingdom of God has come and resided and people have been able to be there. <clears throat> now there's, there's kind of a movement in the way this text talks about it. In the first text, it talks about <clears throat> that every Israelite has this. In, in the second one, it talks more about the idea that everyone has one. In the third, it's, and then we are all able to invite our neighbors to live under the fig tree and the vine. There's this idea of the kingdom of God moving from about us to out into the world and being able to invite people into it. But this idea is also that it has been stable and been there a while. Now, that's one of the things I see in the Old Testament about this is, is you had to have stability for a long period of time. Now, in the Middle East, it's a rough neighborhood. If you ever go to, miss, to visit the Middle East, there are wars everywhere you go. There was the war of this. There was the war of that. There was the war of this. Here's where the Romans came marching in. Here's where, you know, there's always somebody marching into town. And one of the things they do when they march into the town is they take all your food. All right? And then the next thing they do, if they really don't like you and they want to do warfare so that you can never have a place to have a base again is they cut down all your fruit trees and they cut down all the places that you can grow things and if they really don't like you then they put salt on it all so that your place is no longer able to support life but in this vision of the kingdom Jesus says to Nathaniel I saw you sitting under a fig tree to a man who's looking for the coming of the kingdom of God. Do you hear what he hears? My heart's desire is coming through this man in Christ. Yes. Yes, I'll go and follow. The Samuel passage, and I just want to touch on it for a few minutes, <clears throat> there, there, there's something really interesting in the Samuel passage. And the, the area hadn't heard from God in a while. That's what it says. They, they weren't used to hearing from God anymore. I think that's because they weren't listening. I, you know, I think if we're listening for God, we'll hear from God. I think that's more on us than it is on God. If you're listening for God and you're saying, here I am, Lord, you're going to hear from the Almighty. But here... Samuel is, and he is waiting, and he hears from God. And what is his answer? Here I am, O Lord, right? I'm listening. <clears throat> now, we didn't read the rest of this passage uh, that was assigned in the reading today. It goes on quite a bit, but it basically says, and, and it's news for Samuel, uh, that Eli's family is done. Okay, you can go back and read it. So Samuel gets the news, he goes and he hears from the Lord, and the Lord gives him this whole, he's Eli, who is uh, the leader at the time, he's, he's, Eli's sons have not been doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're doing all the things they're not supposed to be doing, and I'll tell you, the Bible's rather specific. So just go back and read it if you want to read it, but it's basically, they are not living a holy life, and the news that Samuel gets is, your job 
is to step into those shoes and to bring holiness into this world. You see, I think that's what calling is about. Calling is hearing from God and bringing the kingdom of God here into earth. Nathaniel's call, Samuel's call, all these calls are to bring about this place that we can live in, this place of stability, this place of love, this place of fruit and prosperity. And that is God's vision for us. You know, if you're, if you're living in a time right now of nervousness, if you're living in a time of you're worried about a lot of this stuff, trust me, the world has been in a lot worse shape before. It's been a lot messier. But God's promise is what? That everyone will have a vine and a fig tree and they shall not live in fear. That is the place that God is calling us to. My prayer for you and for me is may we each individually live into holiness so that this world knows prosperity. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is page 419, I am thine, O Lord. Would you stand and join me as we sing? Now hear these words as I send you out in the world that will deny that there is a place of peace. Know that both Nathaniel and Samuel had a rough time. They had a rough time, but I guarantee you there was inward peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.